Hi, this is David Duvac, uh, contract pilot, charter pilot, flight instructor. Uh, welcome back to my channel. It's been a while since I've made anything. I've been busy uh, training for my other job here um, and uh, back in the area uh, and figured I'd uh, utilize this time to update the channel. So um, if you like the channel, uh, hit the like button, uh, subscribe, and uh, just feel free to add any comments as to what uh, anything in particular you might see. Today I got with me here a 1979 Grumman Tiger. Um, this is going to be an introduction to the Grumman Tiger. Um, Grumman, Grumman, the aircraft itself, um, made these from the 60s straight through the uh, mid 2000s, about 2007. Uh, started out as, uh, I believe, Northrop Grumman, which is a company that made World War II era aircraft um, during the Second World War. And then I believe it was uh, transferred to uh, a company changed its name to American um, Grumman American Aircraft. Um, where they made civilian aircraft, uh, such as this Grumman Tiger here. Uh, they first made the Grumman AA-1, um, where the AA-1, uh, I'll commonly refer to as a trainer, is a two-seat version of this. It has much less horsepower in the power plant up front. Uh, then they made several variations of the trainer. There was the Lynx. Um, then they made the first four-seater, which is the Cheetah, and the Cheetah was, is about a foot smaller than this airplane and width and it's rated at 150 horsepower, while this airplane is rated at 180 horsepower. Um, then they made another variation before the Tiger, then they actually made the Tiger. Um, not a common airplane, but a lot of owners are, are uh, consulting. This airplane is their first choice of owner, um, of an airplane to own, because um, it's reasonably economic to own. Uh, it's got a fuel burn of about nine to 11 gallons an hour, depending on your power settings. Um, it's got a max gross weight of around 2,400 pounds, so it could fit three uh, pilots of my figure on a cool day, uh, near full tanks of gas at a bag or two. Uh, you also, what's cool about this airplane is that it's got a canopy, where unlike the Cessna, which you see me demonstrate a walk-around inspection before, this canopy, unlike a, unlike a Cessna, which you see a couple of these parked over here, um, this canopy provides um, you know, cock the cooling when it's reasonably warm out. Uh, so, you know, you're not sweating. Uh, it comes best handy in the summer when you're, you know, doing multiple, doing a long trip or multiple takeoff and landings and you need a reason to cool off. So when you land, you pop this, pop the canopy open and you let the air cool you off. Um, you could also operate in flight with this canopy open up to about 105 knots, but you can't bring it all the way back. Um, I don't do it personally, but, you know, teach its own. Um, it has four seats. Uh, this aircraft is of a 1979 era. And um, structurally speaking, it's got different uh, structure of an airframe than um, your typical Cessna or Piper, which you see parked over here at the airport. Um, these wings have uh, a light composite and um, a honeycomb structure, um, which gives the aircraft extra lift and gives the aircraft extra strength to propel and thrust in flight. So uh, because of that, this aircraft is sportier as far as cruise speed than others. You can get an honest 140 miles an hour out of this plane, uh, which is neat because the Cessnas over here do about 120, uh, give or take. Um, one also good thing is that um, uh, the aircraft is reasonably stable. Um, therefore, on semi-windy days, it takes the wind like a breeze. Um, had a light crosswind coming in here today at Old Bridge. And, uh, um, with the trees here doing what they do, it, it handled it pretty well. Um, um, I've had four people on this plane once. Um, it was a cool day. We weren't at max takeoff way or nothing, but you can you can load it up. Just know where you are in relationship to the max takeoff, the max gross weight, and the center of gravity limits. Um, so I'm going to show you a typical walk around that we do of a low wing airplane. Because uh, there are some things that uh, are, are that vary and are different on a low-wing airplane versus a Cessna, which is what most students start out in. Um, you wouldn't see student pilots train a Grumman. Um, one of the reasons being is that the landing gear configuration is different, particularly the front nose wheel. Um, it's not as forgiving of rookie landings as the Cessna is. Um, but again, this is a lot of, a lot of uh, private pilots who get to go on and get their certificates. I have seen pilots uh, buy this as their first choice of airplane because it's a good step up from the Cessna. Um, so like any walk-around inspection, the walk-around inspection begins 
when you're walking up to the airplane. Um, again, looking out for big picture stuff, like I explained in my last uh, pre-flight inspection video. You know, you want to obviously ensure the wings are attached, the tail's attached, big picture stuff. Nothing is sticking out of you that's an immediate concern. Um, the next, we would position ourselves in the cockpit, and I'm not going to do this because I already did it, but we would turn on the radio master uh, with the battery switch there um, to ensure that the battery can, the master switch can power up the battery. Um, and I would check to ensure that my fuel gauges read um, and <clears throat> you know, see what, what the fuel gauge is indicating fuel level wise. Again, we check it visually um, as part of our walk around. Um, and then we climb out of the aircraft and we start here. And then normally the landing flaps would be extended. You would just check to ensure that they have movement. Um, obviously they're up because I'm leaving them up for a reason. Um, then we make our way around to the aileron. Well, it's just like on the Cessna, you're moving it, you're looking for the same thing as you are in the Cessna, that the aileron is free to move, and then you cross-check it in the cockpit to make sure it's free to move, just like so. Then you make your way around to the wingtip, and you're looking for obvious signs of damage. Um, unlike the high wings, the low wings have the uh, wingtip lights on a panel here just because they sit with the ground and debris and whatnot, you know, hit the bulb, contact the bulb. And then, unlike the Cessna, something we do different in low wing is that we scotch down like this, just to ensure that there's no obvious signs of damage, anything indicating that someone might have hit the airplane or leaks or things of that nature. Uh, if the aircraft was tied down, which the tie down hook is right here, we would take that out, or undo the rope, sorry. Um, but because I had just parked this airplane, uh, we don't need to tie down. We're making our way along to the uh, leading edge of the wing. Um, and this is, not, this is an item that's not in the checklist, but um, this is a stall strip. In the event where you enter what's called an aerodynamic stall condition, this gives the aircraft uh, the ability to stall evenly. Um, but I always check to make sure that it's not damaged. Um, you could test the stall horn by placing on the master switch and flicking this tab in the up position. Um, but I just landed, it went on during landing, so it does work. Um, and then normally, um, you would undo your fuel cap like so, you just pull it out, twist it, see what you have in the tank. Um, and then you position yourself down to the right side of the right main landing gear. Now, a little something I got to point out in the last video, this airplane has what's called wheel skits. And it's very common in the Grumman's to uh, see a Grumman with wheel skits. Um, the purpose of this is to get, get you an extra five to 10 knots in cruise. Um, and you want to ensure that it's all nice and tight like this one is, and there's no cracks or anything in that nature because these sit on, uh, on the low to the ground and they come contact with a lot of rocks and what have you that could crack this thing. So um, they want to inspect your tire, which is kind of hard to do with a wheel skip, but you can you generally see the general condition from here. Um, it's not worn out or nothing. Um, and then the brakes are back side of the wheel skit and you just want to can't see it but you just want to make sure there's nothing leaking out and then if you are attending the fly for real there's a fuel sump there's a fuel sump right by the right main landing gear here that you would insert your fuel sump in to check for contaminants um just flew uh so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna check that um unlike the cessna some low wings this one you can uh, you pop open the engine cowling um, to inspect the works. Um, but I can also see that through the oil access door, which is right here. So oil access door is right here. Um, it's a little hot because I just flew it. Yeah, I'm looking for proper oil level here. So it uh, looks like just over four. That's good. Four or five. Then I use this chance to peek in the opening here where I can see the works of the engine to make sure nothing is placed a concern to me. So that's that. Close that and make it away over to the front of the airplane. Now, as I was saying in the last pre-flight inspection video of a Cessna, we always treat the propeller like it's the most dangerous part of the airplane. This thing just flew, but I know the ignition uh, was grounding because I do a ground check after I end each flight. If I were to take the prop and turn into a direction like so, 
It is possible, if I don't know if the ignition is grounding, that the uh, P League can generate a spark, fire up, and that would be a bad day. So I always tell guys, place your hand along the edge of the blades like so. Just feel for big nicks and gashes and things of that nature. Um, same thing on the lower blade. And then check in your engine, cooling inlets right here for anything that could be a concern. Um, some airplanes, you can, you can feel the alternator belt. You can't in the Grumman, not a big deal. Um, and then the nose wheel, unlike the Cessna, um, this is a castoring nose wheel for the aviation minded. Um, what that means is that the pedals individually don't steer this plane on the ground. Um, this aircraft depends on, on differential braking. So we use brakes to steer this aircraft on the ground, but when we're in the high speed regime of the takeoff, we use rudders like an assessment of steer. Um, making our way over now to the uh, pilot side of the nose. Um, uh, not part of the checklist, but um, first flight of the day, I will inspect this. Um, you know, this is the pilot side cowling, just because the brake reservoir is up here. I can check brake fluid, and I can look for anything that's a concern in the power plant. Um, then here is our avionics cooling fan, uh, which cools the radio, so I just make sure it's not covered like that. Um, this is a fan for your, your vent here, your ventilation control, so you don't sweat to death on a hot day in the airplane. Um, then making way over to the pilot side wing, start here, and then there's a fuel drain right over here where you get a sample of fuel to ensure it's not contaminated. Um, and then just like the right side landing gear, you inspect the, inspect the left side landing gear. And that little play is okay as long as it's not really loose. And again, with the wheel skirt, you want to check for um, damage, anything that could be a concern to you. Um, and then you make your way up. Again, you check the stall strip. I do anyway to make sure it's not damaged. And then this has a spare stall strip on this side too. Um, you would normally inspect your fuel tank and sure, see what you have visually in the tank. Um, and then making your way over to the leading edge of the wing here. And as I've pointed out, the right, on the right side, inspect the uh, wingtip panel light and make sure it's not damaged, or the wingtip panel, excuse me. Uh, also ensure you have the right light in there. Um, you want to see red on the left and green on the right. That indicates the position of the aircraft. And I didn't explain this on the other side, but this fin here is a speed mod. This gives the aircraft extra speed and flight. Uh, very common you see these on Grumman's and Moonies. Um, one of the things that makes this, thing, this airplane unique is that this has what's called a laminar flow wing. Um, meaning that um, it requires a high landing speed just to slow down a landing. And if you don't manage your energy right in the landing phase of your flight, um, you will float, uh, which is why this airplane is not a common trainer. Um, schools have had these to train people in to get their licenses, but um, uh, the incident and accident statistic has proven that um, this airplane can be a bit much of an airplane for a student to handle just because of the wing design. Otherwise, a great airplane. Um, I'd buy this plane myself if I had the money, but that's a different discussion for a different day. Um, but anywho, so just like the right side, coming on down, and then unlike the Cessna, um, the Cessna, the pitot tube, is situated closer to the pilot door. The pitot tube in the Grumman is situated uh, under the left side of the wing. This gives the ability for your airspeed, vertical speed indicator gauge, and your uh, altimeter gauge to, to read. Um, Without pitot tube, you won't have indirect indication of airspeed. And just like the right side, we're gonna inspect the underside of the wing here for anything we should be concerned about. Obviously, if the plane was tied down, you would take the uh, rope out like so. Um, then, just like the other side, you inspect the ailerons. Then I watch in the cockpit to ensure they move correctly as I do this. Okay. All right, so that's good. And then. If the land, if I had a reason to, if I was going flying, I'd extend the landing flaps to make sure they have some play. Um, then make my way back to the uh, left side fuselage. Unlike um, the Cessna, or actually much like the Cessna, your baggage door is right here. Only it's a, the door's axis is smaller, but you actually have quite a bit of room in the trunk here. You can store, I believe, up to 150 pounds of baggage, which is cool. Um, and then making my, way, way, making my way back to the tail, checking all my antennas, make sure they're in place. Um, navigation antennas, the V thing up top, just like in a Cessna. 
And unlike a Cessna, the Cessna has what's called an elevator where, um, you know, um, most of the, actually, I take that back. This, this, this airplane um, does have something like an elevator, uh, but it's got a bigger trim tab. Um, so what you're looking for is just like in a Cessna, proper movement like so. Um, and so you, obviously you're looking in the cockpit to make sure you see the yoke moving when you do this. And you're also feeling for any binding when you're doing this. So, uh, so if the elevator or the stabilator uh, binds, and does jerky movements, you have an issue. Um, and then unlike the system that I was trying to say earlier, um, this aircraft not only has a bigger trim tab, but it has dual trim tabs, and it makes the aircraft stable by doing so. Um, and then your rudders right here, which uh, you're not supposed to push on this for the POH, but I just like to give it a little bit of a rattle to make sure it has some play in it. Um, and then I inspect the insides, which is right here in the elevator, or the stabilator. What I'm looking for is anything making a home, because this is the time of the year where you will see birds uh, making a home in the works. And um, this is an ADS-B device. Um, it's something we were required to have as of January 1st. I always make sure that's on and tacked. Um, then I make one final pass to ensure the airplane is good to go. So uh, that's your introduction to the Grumman Tiger. That's what we're looking for on our walk around inspections. This aircraft versus a 172. As far as some general specifics, I mentioned the horsepower, 180. Uh, the, the gross weight, um, the aircraft holds 42 gallons total of a usable 40.5, I believe. Um, it's got a range of going from here to, uh, depending on the winds upstairs, uh, to the, the North Carolina area. Um, takeoff speed is the same as Cessna, 60 knots. We climbs about 80. Um, your approach speed uh, starts out at 80, but then we, uh, I cross the numbers around 70 knots. Um, it'll generate about 2,700 RPM in the power. Uh, one thing I, I, I didn't mention was the landing flaps are uh, all electric like a Cessna. They're not manual like a Piper. Um, so that is a maintenance item you have to watch every now and then. Uh, as far as buying one of these, you could buy one of this era uh, for 79 era for about uh, oh, 40 to 50,000. And the prices can vary as high as uh, 70000 depending on the, the year of the Tiger you're looking to buy. So um, that's today's video. If you like, comment, you know, subscribe, and uh, look forward to making more videos soon.